Welcome to the Sri Lankan Understanding, a media platform aimed at exploring the path taken by Sri Lanka, an island in the Indian Ocean, which has experienced a vivid past and has the potential for a vibrant future. Enlivening museums is the topic of conversation today, where we talk about them as being repositories of the past and gateways to the future. Museums are said to be cultural powerhouses. And to talk with us about museums in Sri Lanka and in general, we have an arts manager, independent consultant and development professional, who is a sociologist by training from the Delhi University in India and the Lund University in Sweden. She studied museum anthropology at the Columbia University in New York. Welcome, Hassini, to the program. Thank you, George. It's lovely to be here. Hassini, if you were to start and ask you, museums, why did you start thinking of museums or studying them or exploring them? It's a rather unusual topic to get into. Yes, it is actually. And um, so professionally, all my life, I've been involved with working on arts and culture and peace building and education. So I've worked with a lot of artists, a lot of communities, a lot of universities and schools in dealing with topics like social justice, peace building, reconciliation, and also really pursuing this through a cultural dimension. And then I started realizing that a museum is a place that brings all of this together, you know, especially when we are trying to tackle difficult topics like the conflict, the root causes of conflict, you start realizing that the history plays a huge role in all of this. And the, the, the space of a museum is a place that has space for all of this and brings all of this together to talk about education, talk about our vision to the future. So that's where I started getting more and more interested in museums and finding that these are formidable institutions that has a huge capacity to serve our country. In another way, I feel it has many roles to play in our future, especially in shaping a vision. You know that in our country right now, a crisis is about visionary re leadership forget about leadership, about vision. And I feel that vision doesn't come out of nothing. You know, It has to come out of something. It has to come out of knowing where we come from and knowing where we want to go. And museums are places where you can go for inspiration for a vision. You know, you know the word museum comes from the word muse, which is about inspiration. So for me, museums are places that we go to to, to get inspired to think about our future and, not, and take lessons from our past. And I think this is very critical for Sri Lanka today in facing its future. The second point is about cultural capital. You know, we are really talking a lot about economics these days, that our biggest challenge of the country at the moment is rising up to the economic challenges, the global crisis and all of that. But I think that's only part of the story because all these things are not just one thing. It has a cultural dimension to it. Poverty, eradication cannot happen unless you also in a way address the cultural dimensions of it. And this is where we have to start talking about cultural capital. Why do we call the developed countries in the world rich? It's not simply because they're materially rich and economically they have soaring GDPs. It's also because they have the cultural capital. And this is with the element that's really important for a future of a country. Without cultural capital, you cannot build a rich vision that can take us to a long, uh, on a long journey. And for me, when I visit the Colombo Museum, for instance, I start understanding what kind of a role has Sri Lanka or the island that we today call Sri Lanka has been playing in the global scene since second century BC. And then I start seeing a future for this country. I mean, and we take those lessons from the past. So I think. That's why I find museums really interesting spaces because you bring all of it together. You bring history, you bring the future, you bring education, you bring social justice issues that we have to tackle about the, at the current point. So it's a space for us to come together and work together. And I find that so exciting. Hasani, as we mentioned, they're repositories of the past. Mm -hmm. So they're also going to represent the past, but maybe also there are ways and means through which we can interpret or reinterpret the past. 
But what are the challenges in doing so? Yes, I think past is very crucial, especially in the way it serves our present moment and our future. Actually, this is the politics of the past. You know, what kind of a past are we talking about? And I don't think it's just necessarily about the past. It is about the politics of our present uh, condition. You know, the way we look at the past is often fashioned by the present moment that we are living in. So I think if we want a more inclusive, a more peaceful future, we have to look back at a past which can give us lessons for this. So that is why I feel the way the whole world looks at the past can be problematic sometimes, not just Sri Lanka, you know. When we look at what we learn about in history books in schools, a lot of it is just dates, a lot of it is about kings and um, very powerful people, a lot of it is about wars. But if we want a future that is different, I think we have to start looking at the past and bringing out different stories. It's not that those stories did not exist, it's just that we haven't recorded it like that, you know. So we have to start looking at different stories. What was Sri Lanka like in 2nd century BC? What was its relationship with the rest of the world? We know that Taprobane was mentioned or actually illustrated in Ptolemy's map of the ancient known world. So how did such a small island get there? You know. So instead of focusing on the kings and the wars and how the normal history that we often learn, we have to look at, look for us and search for a different history. What, what do all these Chinese coins, the Egyptian coins, the Greek amphoras that we have found in Mantai, in Kandy, in Yapahua, in Anuradhapura, in Polonaru, what do all these artifacts tell us? You know, these artifacts tell us a different story about our country. And I think museums can really bring these small objects to life by telling these different stories. So as long as we are stuck in representing the past in a traditional manner where power dynamics and power stories dominate the scene, I think this is not possible. So I think we re the biggest challenge is to go get beyond this mindset of looking at just an elite past that is constructed often for the convenience of um, certain people to, to include other narratives, other stories. And museums also have to move forward in that direction. I think the, the museums in the world are moving and we are also moving, but we have a lot more to improve in this um, dimension. Because if you really look at even the common Sinhala term that we use for a museum, it is katugi which literally translates back into house of bones, right? So this is a very archaic or outdated understanding of museums, I would say. Of course, these spaces started off uh, about two, three hundred years back as storage spaces, as places where people collected things and took care of them. But by today, they play very different roles in the international arena for their own people, but also for diplomatic relations of all these countries coming together. So I believe we have to also look at our museums in a new way, with fresh eyes, and move forward beyond the katuge, beyond the storehouse, to, a, to f redefine it as a space where we think about our future, we think about our community, and engage our communities a little bit more. Thank you. We're going to move further in understanding museums in Sri Lanka when we come back. Welcome back. We're in conversation with Hasini Haputantri on enlightening museums as repositories of the past and gateways to the future. Hasini, before we went to the break, we talked about so many uh, areas of interest within the concepts of museums. We have about 120 in Sri Lanka. How well patronized are they? They are pretty well patronized. Um, in 2017, I did a study of uh, Sri Lankan museums 
especially because when I studied museums and museum anthropology in Colombia and I came back, I didn't know where to start. So one of the things was to actually even understand how many museums do we really have out there. And I thought maybe 10, 20, and then I was surprised actually to find trays around 120 museums and its number is growing even within the last two years we've had about two three museums coming up so it's a dynamic field although people it's not a topic that's on top of people's minds but it's a fast growing uh, industry or a sector I would say especially with the influx of tourism it's very important we will talk about this topic of tourism and museums a little bit later on so in my study I took um, a sample of 25 museums to study them and I tried to evaluate them under six different criteria and one of them was on accessibility which means how well visited are they are they just boring places gathering dust which nobody really visits or are they really well patronized and I'm very glad to say that one thing that's really good about Sri Lankan museums is that they are really well patronized let me give you some figures because this is just not just opinion so I have figures from 2017 2017 first quarter up to April the Colombo uh, National Museum had about 54,400 um, visitors out of which about 35,000 more than 35,000 were school children um, another example is from Polo Naru Archaeological Museum which is actually in conjunction with the heritage site of Polo Naru um, in the um, in January there was about 25,000 February 29,000 people um, in 2017s these are the figures that I have and they have of course increased up until COVID last year when the museums technically had to um, close down so what I really realized about museums are they are very well visited and if you go through some of the feedback that's given in books you also see that people love museums people believe in museums people do come to museums to feel to learn about their past about their identity so this is really important and for most people the first visit to the museum as a child is a very memorable moment you know so the, it, it actually does play a vital role in a person's life so accessibility is very high in Sri Lanka it could be better even with everything else it could be better but there are other areas that we need to really start trying to reach the standards of the world today to be competitive to offer what's better not just to the world and to tourism but to our own children and our future generation for instance so one of the areas that we can do much better is in terms of museum pedagogy or museum education in um, in very normal terms so very few museums offer educational programs that combine the curricula that are being taught at uh, schools and very few museums offer guided tours I mean these are only offered to tourists more or less and seen as something that only tourists are involved in so actually this is again a wrong understanding of museums and the work that museums do I think they have immense education educational value and not just in terms of teaching history but other things you know that we have natural history museums we can have science museum and that is another area which we can improve when you look at the 120 uh, museums that we have most of them I can't remember I think about 80 percent maybe uh, are archaeological museums and I think in a way it's good but in a way it also shows that other segments need to grow natural history science uh, what about anthropology and different community museums you know if you look at the world today community museums are very important sites of community engagement and community building because we are talking about participatory development today right so this is important for instance we do have one of those community museums in Sri Lanka tea plantation workers museum in Gampulav it's a very small cute museum if you visit it they've taken a line uh, room uh, a set of line rooms that the tea plantation workers used to come and live originally about 100 years back 
and converted into a museum space in a very beautiful way where you actually walk in and you are transported back in time to experience what would a tea plantation worker have experienced in coming to Sri Lanka and working in it. So the way they live, the little um, utensils that you used, all of that is presented and all of these are telling the story of people who came to this island and contributed to the economy and the most enduring brand that Sri Lanka has at the moment, Ceylon tea, right? What is the story behind that? And this is important for that community to have a sense of identity and to, to belong to this country. So I think these are areas that we can really improve education, community building, making it more participatory spaces and also in telling stories, you know. So again, my initial point about being um, a storehouse, you know, it's not just to care for old things. Of course, one of the things is preservation and conservation. That's one of the uh, fundamental uh, roles that a museum plays, but it's not just for that. It is about engaging the public, educating the public, getting public to co-create the museum. You know, so in terms of curation, the world is in a completely different league than we are right now. For instance, curation, the concept of curation isn't very well understood in Sri Lanka so, for, so far. And at the moment, one of the challenges we are facing is the local terminology for these. You know, people don't know the Sinhala term for curator is Abhirakshaka. It's not known by many people. And that's why I'm talking about it. I want to bring this up onto the table. And so thank you for this opportunity as well. You know, it, it's reaching some people and people will start thinking about it. So we need to bring new concepts, find new words to bring the discussion of museums up to date with the rest of the world so that it serves us and our future generations, especially in terms of education and also in terms of nation building. Because right now we have gone through a very critical period in our history. 30 years we have wasted on war, fighting, and now it's been 10 years since we saw an end to that. So we have real challenges in front in terms of defining a very inclusive identity where everybody can contribute to the progress and growth in this country, a place where every can be, everyone, everybody can belong. So we have to start telling stories of all the communities, celebrating the diversity and multicultural cultural heritage of this island which is there because it comes from being a hub in the ancient world, a port of call for all the east and west trade. And we've had this multicultural identity since times immemorial. It's just not articulated that well in our textbooks and our museums. So I think that is really uh, what is needed in terms of things that we do well already in terms of accessibility, but other things that we want to improve education, um, nation building, uh, vision and engaging people a lot more. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. When we come back, we're going to be speaking about the restitution of artifacts. <music> Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. Hasini, we've got so many Sri Lankan artifacts in museums around the world. Restitution of them, bringing them back home, what are your thoughts on it? It's a controversial topic and there is no easy answer for it. Um, I know the popular understanding of it is also being, oh, can we take care of them the same way as those museums in the West do? Because obviously we have to admit they have more resources, their security is much better and they are well looked after there, no doubt about it. But I also want to approach it from a very different angle, from the angle of the local communities. George, I often take school children to the National Museum and um, in, in to, before COVID happened, I, the last group I took there was a group of children from Monaragala district and Vavunia district and they were coming to the National Museum for the first time, most of them. And then I was talk, uh, showing them the figure of Tara, which is actually a replica of what we have in the British Museum, uh, which was taken, uh, or actually f looted 
uh, and is now a highlight of the South Asia Gallery in the British Museum. And the fact that maybe a privileged few in this country who can go through the drama of getting a British visa and actually visiting the British Museum can afford to go and look at this. But what about these other children from Monaragala? You know, they, they have a right to see their, their heritage as well and not just a bad replica of it. And it is true, I think it's not a matter of practicality here sometimes, it's a matter of principle. So in principle, it should be ours, we should have it back. Uh, we have the right because the country has to see it. And then what should we do in order to take good care of it? So I think giving the um, answer that we are not good enough to look at it is not the right way to proceed about it. I think we have to get better at it. People have to be aware of it and people have to hold the museum authorities, the museum professionals responsible for taking good care of the artifacts that's there. And if people care about it, then they can't just get away. I know in our current context this can be easier said than done, but I still feel that's the right direction to go. Meanwhile, we shouldn't also make it uh, a war with the Western powers and bring back all these uh, nationalistic arguments about bringing it home. I don't think that's the parochial way in which we should do it. I think we should take it as an opportunity to create an intercultural understanding of give and take and uh, move forward with that. Briefly, before we wrap up, Asini, in terms of new methodologies, mm -hmm. we're in the 21st century, we're looking at ways and means through which we can preserve what we have. And there are lots of projects that have been undertaken and lots of museums in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on where we're going in that direction? I know you're also working on a book project at the moment on museums, memory and identity in Sri Lanka. Uh, would you like to tell us about that briefly and also the new methodologies in place? Thank you. So when I was doing this research in 2017 on which the book Museums, Memory and Identity Politics are act it's actually based on that research that I did uh, about two, two years back and ongoing work that I'm doing with the museums, uh, what I wanted to look at is to see the gap between where our museums are at and where we should be in order to serve our own community better and also to reach the standards that we see around the global, glo globe today. So um, I think we do really need to move on with new methodologies and by this I don't merely mean technological innovations. I'm not just talking about touch screens, expensive touch screens and technology. This is just one dimension of it. I'm not against it, but I think it's got more to it than just bringing in technology and touch screens and all these you know, um, gimmicky things. I think it's really about thinking through our exhibitions, our curation to make objects come alive. The way we present a certain object has to change. You know, so this is a new methodology in terms of curation, bringing objects to life and giving them stories to narrate. That is number one, which is more important. Then you can use touch screens or new technology in doing that, but that is serving a very different purpose. That's one. Second is about engagement and interactivity. How do we engage with our visitor? You know, is it just passing through? A lot of the time I see children just walking through the museum like it's a park, uh, you know, just walking through. How do we engage them? What are the walking tours we can give them? How can we train teachers? Even back in 1970s, Sri Lanka had programs that it was the National Museum offered teacher training programs where teachers came and got trained in how do you use a museum to teach students uh, in a more interactive, experiential way. So this is what needs to happen. The third angle is about community, how to bring the community's voice inside the museum through met methodologies like oral history, for instance. So those are in very few words ways and new methodologies that we can bring to update and make our in museums more futuristic and more inclusive and more engaging. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hasini. You're doing some wonderful work on your own, in your own capacity. And of course, museums also are coming back to life. Mm -hmm. They certainly are living up to being repositories of the past and gateways to the future. And that was the Sri Lankan understanding for today. Join us again next time when we look at the path this country has taken and the potential for the future. Thank you.